The Rock Hunters Podcast with Gary Kemp and Guy Pratt. Hello, Joe. Welcome to The Rock Hunters, mate. Good to see you, bud. Been a while. <clears throat> yeah, it's, it has been a while. Well, we see each other off and on, but we got to know each other a lot in the mid 80s, didn't we? But we'll, yes, we'll we did. In, in the strangest of circumstances, we found ourselves in Ireland, in Dublin, Ireland, uh, yourselves, Dev Leopard, and occasionally, and Frankie goes to Hollywood. And occasionally Terence Trent Derby and one or two others passed through. And um, if you remember rightly, we had this great hangout called the Pink Elephant. And then we'd go down to the Bordello. <laughs> yes, we? yes, there was Lily's oh, Bordello, yeah. Lily's Bordello down at the bottom of Grafton Street. You walk in and like Bono's singing, you know, Sweet Caroline or Song Song Blue with the pianist. And that was the surprising, beautiful thing about it is how we got on so well. It sounds um, like there, there needs to be a coffee table book. It's like the sort yeah, of you know Studio what? 54 memories, of Dublin. Yeah, if our memories were that strong, it would be a great coffee table. But I fear after everything we've gone through, it would be a pamphlet. And we were all making records at the same time, weren't we? And, you know, not really realising how successful those records were going to end up being, especially Hysteria in your case. Well, we're- same with you. You know, I'll be, I'll be bluntly honest with you. I've often wondered, whenever I've heard... Um, through the barricades have gone, this is a fucking rock song. We could have written this. He's been hanging out with us too long. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to have to come up, isn't it? The Gary did BVs. I yes, he did. Yes. Yes. He did. He actually sang uncredited, I'm afraid. I don't know which song you were on, Gary. Is it Animal? Animal, yeah. Yeah, I mean, what a song to be on. I thought it was a British oh. hit. I mean, there's a pub quiz question right there. Yeah. <laughs> Love yeah, that. no, I've, I've, I've never forget that, you know, and, uh, and it was it was it was such a I remember you coming over to mine and we were always talking about Bowie and we were always talking about the glam rock that we loved and, and Mott. And, you know, I think that's where we connected most of all, isn't it? Absolutely. There's there's no shame in what I call the letter Y, which is like you're coming up from the bottom and then it, it, you go left, I go right. You know, um, this happened in Sheffield. I remember. I used to hang out in this record shop called Record Collector in Broom Hill, 500 yards from my mom and dad's house where I was obviously was living at the time. And I'd be leafing through, you know, picking up Slaughter on 10th Avenue by Mick Ronson to see if it was less scratch than mine because it was only 50p. And then this kid comes in with short hair on one side and long on the other, and it's Phil Oakey. Uh-huh. All right, Phil. All right, Joe. Yeah, uh-huh. Mick Ronson, give us that, you know. Big Bowie fans, you know, obviously. Let More obvious than us because... The music that Def Leppard makes doesn't really reflect, um, say, a history of fandom with David Bowie, even though I've actually sung, I think, now 33 Bowie songs, either for TV shows or on record. But so, there are, there's so many Bowies, isn't there? I mean, there is a, there is a rock Bowie. There is, but Absolutely, you know. me and Gary were weaned on the Ronson, Boulder, yeah. Woodman, Sea, Spiders Bowie. And then, obviously, depending on your point of view, what he did after that was either better, okay, just different, or not as good. But well, you can't deny the fact that we both saw Starman that, that fateful night in uh, July 72 or June 72, when uh, he yep. flung his arm around Mick Ronson and the whole adult population, our parents freaked out if they saw it. And when Bowie did this... I had to phone someone, so I picked up... It's the one, you know, we were, we were, we were in, you know, that was our generation. You see T-Rex do ride a white swan on top of the pops, your life changes forever. Right. And that's when mine started to flicker. And then it was Get It On um, and Jeepster. But then when Bowie came along with this alien, but I remember as though it was yesterday, laying on my single bed at my parents' house, listening to Ziggy Stardust and looking at the four shots of the band, real face close-ups on the inside bag, black and white. Yeah. And, um, and just looking at them and soaking them up. And as a 12 year old, by the time you get to rock and roll suicide, the last track of the record, you think, you know, these people, <laughs> you know, this is beauty of music to kids. We're a sponge we're a, we're a blank canvas that just needs filling in. And we have a choice to, like or not like, you know. Was there like a first gig you went to that? First gig I ever went to was T-Rex. I pushed the swing doors open. They got those two like portal windows in the swing doors into the stalls. And they'd just gone on stage. He was playing Jeepster. And I'd never been in the city hall before. I'd never been to any gig before. 
And all I could see was this sea of hair going up and down, like, like you'd expect to see at a status quo gig. I remember it was a great wash of lights and volume and excitement because the crowd were as much of a part of this gig as, as the band were. So cut to nine years later, Def Leppard have released their first album. He's gone top 20 and we sold out the Sheffield City Hall. And I walked onto the stage and I stood where Mark Bolan was and looked at where I was uh, looking at Bolan nine years previously. What a moment for me as a kid, as it was, I was 20 years old, to stand where I'd stood as an 11 year old, looking at where I was back at where Bolan was. And now I'm where Bolan was. It was a strange, strange feeling. You, you know, um, what's, what was going on in Sheffield is quite famous. You know, the, 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 probably the first electronic band comes along with, with the Human League. I was aware of the Human League. We opened for the Human League on our third gig. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me explain. Our first ever gig was at a school where we got paid five pounds by the teacher out of his pocket. The next gig was in a field where three people and a dog came and it went dark and there was no light. So our mates drove their cars in front of us and turned the headlights on. <laughs> we could finish the set and see where the fingers went on a fretboard. And the third gig was this free festival, it was called, where you didn't get paid, but they let everybody in for free. So it was a guaranteed full house. And it was the Human League, us, Charles Autry and the Deaf Aids, I think, and Molidori, oh, wow. I think it was. And, you know, we had kind of rent a crowd. We had our mates come down and they came down the front when we were on and buggered off when the Human League went on, you know. So it was a really weird gig, you know. I see where this why sort of begins, right? So if, if you think that Rebel Rebel, you're going in that way. Yep. And then there's Bowie Low and Vossava and whatever the electronic stuff he was doing, rather austere music in Berlin. And that's going that way. And so the Human League are catching that mm -mm. part of it. And yeah. you, you want sex and performance in, in, in your acts. You want- Yeah, we, 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 I suppose we were clinging to, to the past more than Bowie's past than his present. You know, I'm sort of interested also in that, in that new wave of British metal that was beginning yeah. at the same time, because you were- The worst acronym ever. When you're in a band, you have to believe that you can be better than all your heroes were. So when we got lazily lumped by lazy media into this Nawabum thing, it was the timing. The cream of the crop would have been us and Maiden. And there was other bands like um, Vardis, the Tigers of Pantang, uh, Saxon, Saxon yeah. loads of bands down in London probably. And then we, because we were, around at the same time we got bracketed in there and we used to say even then no 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 not being don't want to be part of that there was the mersey sound and there were the beatles <clears throat> so please don't label us because when the movement dies everything in it dies yeah yeah what what um def leppard sort of were doing was so different from the, that that macho darker mm -hmm. uh, music that the bands you just mentioned were doing you know i think you know elements of that glam rock that you loved and tunes and hooks and pop if you like were so well in, in ingrained in your songwriting from an early age if we've got like six songs out of the potential 10 we want on the record and the four that aren't there we will go, we need a song that sounds like uh, Blockbuster. We need a song that sounds like Driving Saturday. We need a song that sounds like We Are The Champions. We would name check a classic song, whether it be 515 by The Who, or whether it be um, Shangri-La by The Kinks. We would name something that makes your skin tingle when you hear it. There's a, a, a few songs that will do that to me for the rest of my life, all the young dudes being the main, the main one. I just want to talk about, you know, when Pyromania comes out and you, you know, you have this massive hit in America all of a sudden, the photograph and, um, and you become one of those strange bands that is bigger outside of the UK. It was really weird that we were very happy for the American success. And in many respects, it gave us this cushion to like, Oh, well, you know, there's always the next album sort of thing. But it was like all your mates and your mom and dad going, why don't we see you on top of the pops? And you say, but we're on American bandstand. Yeah, yeah. But we don't see that, do we? And, you know, 
it was it was weird. It was very strange. It was it was a bit of a disappointment for us, but there was nothing we could do. At least we knew we had the backing of the label. We were a slow burn like Elton John. How many albums before he took off? Six, yeah. maybe. Yeah. Um, but we had to wait a while as well because we disappeared out of the face of the earth until June '87 when we finally what? finished Hysteria, no, and yeah. then the goodwill of uh, the fans finally caught up with Pyromania, m made the so, you know a, a lot easier for Hysteria to become a big record. We had a, our first top ten hit in the summer of '87. The album came out in August and went straight to number one. We weren't expecting that either. We thought it might do okay, but a lot better than Pyromania. But it, so we went from here to there, like in, from one album to the next. And we thought about it and went, well, this is like what happened to Elton with Rocky Man. He went from nothing to here, kind of overnight in 10 years. So doing that album in Ireland when I first met you, uh, do, doing Hysteria, and um, I remember getting there and you'd been there for months and you'd been working with Jim Steinman producing. Yeah. You told me a story that the insanity of that, where he would order everything on the takeaway menu oh, every yes. single day because he couldn't decide what he was going to eat. The first thing he did is he walked into Windmill Studios and he changed the carpet, right? He no, couldn't. Yes no. Am I got that wrong? Sorry. You've got, it, you've got it nearly right. We went over to Holland and the first thing he tried to do was change the carpet in the control room. He did have the carpet changed in his hotel room because he didn't like the colour. He did order one of everything off the menu which was, became a fantastic novelty because even though we were too stupid to not realize like the bad news scene in, in, in more bad news when they're actually paying for the, for the <laughs> food when they're shooting the video, this was all on our tab, uh, not his. We were in a complex with four other bands and for about three months, one of those artists was Mink DeVille and Willie DeVille regularly used to poke his head out of the studio and wait to see if we'd gone. And once we got back in, his entire band would just clear the table. <laughs> like, like seagulls come in after a, a whale washes up. <laughs> Steve Clark and, and, and Phil said, we got to get rid of this guy after like five weeks of working with him. Going, this is just awful. Everything we had sounded dated and just nothing like the previous album, which had been a huge leap. Pyromania was this enormous leap where we didn't make albums. We made the album in 82 and everybody was making albums in 82. They were just miking up the drums, miking up the bass and just sounding like a band on stage. What we did with Pyromania is make an album. We made an album the way that Kraftwerk made one or the Human League, we, we pieced it together. 10 CC. We, yeah. The values of the songs was more important than that. We, we didn't care how we got there as long as we got there. And when Mutt said we can make a high and dry part two, or we can make an album that will challenge people's perceptions of what rock records should sound like. And we were all on board for that. So we yeah. wanted to do the same thing with, with Hysteria again. And make um, the, but the Joe, list. Phil, Phil yeah. had chops to do it as well. Phil's guitar playing. It's, yeah, I mean, but we all had the ambition and we all had the, the wherewithal to listen to the boss. You know, you don't employ Mutt Langing unless you're going to listen to him. What's the point? of arguing with you because this will work. And you go, how? Trust me, I've done it before. Okay, cool. And you hear what he does and you go, wow, okay. I'm never going to challenge you again when it comes to that kind of thing. Oh, so oh, talking of which, sorry, about just about my little thing, Joe, is so the guitar part that was recorded one string at a time. Myth. That is a myth, is it? We did it, we did it on one song on Pyromania actually. And what it was, it was, this, it was a part on the verse of a song called Coming Under Fire. And it's a two string part that goes from a kind of a- Oh, it's only two strings, oh, I'll forget. Minor, <laughs> a minor thing. And the problem with it was that unlike a piano, when you go major minor, it resonates really badly when you play minors with a distortion. Yes. But if you play them a string at a time, they don't resonate because they don't resonate against each other because they're two separate performances. So for this one bit, Mott had said, he'd done this before with, I'm not going to name who, but somebody that you wouldn't expect him to do it with. And he said, no, this will be great. So they just played the root note and then they played the moving note and it sounded like a piano. In other words, it didn't distort. Mm -hmm. And we told this story in, uh, in one I could get guitar magazine 
And it just became Chinese whispers that we played every single guitar part <laughs> at a time, and I sang everything a word at a time, and all this. Kind of stuff. It wasn't like that at all. But if we had to do drop-ins on certain bits, that was no big deal. Gary, yeah. you remember? I'm, I'm, I'm guessing quite easily the documentary part of the "We Are the." Um, do you know it's Christmas when Boy George said, "I'm going to have to drop in for that end word." Because he couldn't jump that low down from yeah. where his voice was to do it, so he had to punch in. Joe, when when I first arrived at the studio that day, I, the, and I don't think I'd really took this in as a piece of news, but the first um, person I met really was Rick, and Rick took me in a room and 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 showed me his Simmons drum kit. And Rick, you know, had just lost his arm. You know, I mean, just literally a few months before. And he was so excited about showing me this Simmons drum kit and how it worked. And I will never forget it, you know, that he could play the hi-hat with one foot. And um, and just the idea of your drummer having that sort of terrible accident. I mean, just tell us a little bit about that whole moment. Well, what he did, he, he was in hospital in a coma. They managed to reattach the arm after the accident for two days and I visited him and saw him with two arms. And his oh, brother man. said, look, touch him. He's warm. It's warm. But then, you know, we left and a day later, we get the phone call that an infection had set in and they had to take it off again. Thank God for him that he was unaware of this because I think that would have been crippling oh, to, wow. you know, mentally just torture to know that he had it and then he didn't. He did find out a lot later on when he was more prepared to hear that news. But for us, it was devastating to think because... We were just thinking, oh, brilliant, he's back on, he'll be all right in a year. But then he lost it. And then the first thing that entered him, I said, well, how the hell is he going to do this? And it was Mutt Lang that had visited him in hospital. And the two of them, Mutt had said, you can still play the drums. He says, you know, do you play jazz? He went, no. He says, then you don't need to go on your hi -hat. You lock the thing shut and you go, which what rock bands do. So you've now got a redundant left foot get some pedals and play the snare drum with your left foot. So he ended up getting this piece of sponge at the bottom of his bed. A would help him sit up because he had no balance. You've got to remember when you lose an arm, you oh, lose wow. an enormous amount of balance. It takes you months to regain and relearn. Um, and he started playing drums with three limbs using this piece of sponge as just in his head. You know, he couldn't hear anything, but he'd be like going, did it dum did it dum did it dum and he would just keep practicing. And then one day he said to us, I can do this. And we all looked at each other and went, it's the morphine talking. Um, you know, we were always like, look, he's not going to get fired. He's going to realize he can't do this and he'll, he'll leave. Or if he can do it, he stays. You know, he's a brother. He's, he's not going to get kicked out. He was supposed to be in hospital for six months. He checked out after six weeks because he was bored shitless. Um, and then he, after about two or three weeks in his mom and dad's house, he just said, I'm going back to the studio. And we were in Holland by then. So he came over to Holland and he just hung. He just sat in the control room listening to what we were doing with the now next stage of his theory, which is the after Steinman and working with Mutt's engineer, Nigel Green, who was a vast improvement. Um, and he, he got this electronic kit made by a guy called Pete Hartley in Sheffield which is now in the, in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, I believe. And he, he had this locked away. We rented a room in, in Whistlord Studios and locked him away in it. And he, nobody went in for four months. He wanted to make all the mistakes on his own. He wanted to fail till he got it right. But eventually he came to us and he said, I want you to come and listen to something. So we all kind of tentatively walked into this room and he got on the kit and he played the intro to When the Levy Breaks by Led Zeppelin. And there was man tears everywhere. Oh, there really was. It was like, wow, you know. In 1986, we were getting cabin fever, as you can imagine, if you've been in the studio since August 84. By then, we've left yeah. Ireland. We've gone. Yeah, yeah, you guys are gone. Thank you've gone. Bands have formed, had hits, and split up while you've been in the studio. Probably, absolutely. Opal's <laughs> career came and went in the town that we did that record. <laughs> yeah. um, so we got offered these shows in Europe. Um, Monsters of Rock Festival with um, Aussie, Scorpions, Motorhead. We went off and did these shows in in, your, in, uh, in Europe with just, the, with just Rick on drums. And I remember when we played Donington, you could tell there was this 
wave of anticipation, also this curiosity. You could see kids trying to peer through the symbols to see how he was doing it. But we'd made this pact to not milk it and we weren't going to introduce him or anything. But about 40 minutes into the set, I remember leaning over to Phil and saying, I can't not. And he went, no, you've got to. So I, at some appropriate time, I said, ladies and gentlemen, please make some noise for Rick Allen. And as I've said many times, it was like a hairdryer. The noise, you could feel it. It physically moved you. They were ready. By the time the album came out and Animal had been a hit, thanks to you, Gary, uh, we, uh, <laughs> we, had this, uh, we had this kind of built-in audience. Joe, you know what? The story is one of the greatest stories. Uh, you know, this rise against adversity that this boy went through. He's had letters by the bucket load from kids that have maybe lost an arm and they've learned to play golf and he's been their inspiration or, you know, they've lost a leg and they've, they've, with, they've learned to run with them. Um, a prosthetic one, all this kind of stuff. And he's, he's often cited as the inspiration. Your reinvention as well and into, you know, later on with a younger audience, with your connection with Taylor Swift is incredible too, you know. <laughs> Her mom was an enormous fan of Def Leppard, um, big fan. And obviously she heard this through the, her mom's stomach, you know, through the wall of her mother's womb. She heard Paul some sugar me a thousand times or whatever. And she always said that we were her favorite band. And I'll never forget our, one of our crew walked onto our bus with his laptop open. And he says, have you read this? And he turns it around and it's this interview with Taylor Swift. And he said, have you ever worked with another band? She says, there's only one band on this planet I'd ever want to work with and it's Def Leppard. And we went, really? Well, let's get in touch with them then. The powers that be, the grown ups all got in touch. And lo and behold, she said, yeah, let's do Crossroad together, which is this great American show where they, they don't put like and like together. They, they put oil and water together. They put us together and the idea was we do four of hers. We do, and she do four of ours, you know? And he, she said, I have to do this song, Love, off a Sparkle Lounge album from 2008, which she really liked. She wanted to do Two Steps Behind. She knew that she, we had to do Sugar, but she said there's certain lines in that song that I can't sing. You'll have to sing those. And, that, you know, and, and we had such a great time. We shot two shows, which they pieced the program together from. And it was really funny seeing the audience because what you had was all the young girls were down the front going crazy for Taylor and looking at us like, okay. And we had all their parents <laughs> looking at us going, yes. And they're looking at Taylor going, I don't know about this. You know? So it was a really bizarre Kind of juxtaposition. I watched it. I thought it was great. She was so into it, wasn't she? Totally. What's next for for the Leopard? We do have songs in the can. Um, so there will be more new music down the road. We've right. just released the third of what's going to be four box sets. We haven't been idle. We've also just um, opened the vault, which is the Def Leopard vault, which is our digital museum. You're the kind of person who's always realised that your past would be dear to you one day and you've yes. collated it as you've gone along. Joe, I've got to say, we, we, it's such a pleasure having yeah. you on this uh, show. I totally enjoyed it, lads. If you ever want to do this again, you know where I am. Oh, mate. I mean, you know, you out rock to the rock on yeah. I mean, absolutely love this one so much. Yeah.